Hello and welcome to the Alatia Foundation podcast. My name is Nawid Jabarkil. Today we're delighted to be joined by Miss Marie Alina van den Bosch. Marie van den Bosch is a visiting scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. Her research currently focuses on green energy and democratization, the effect of climate change and the energy transition on political. She's also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University, where she teaches classes on oil and politics and literature and politics in the Department of Government. She received her PhD in 2018 from Princeton University, where her research focused on economic diversification in oil exporting autocratic systems. Welcome to the podcast, Delina. Thank you so much for having me. Let's start off then. Tell us a bit about the uh, institute you're working with, the Arab Gulf States Institute. Uh, what's the core function of what it does? Oh, yes, of course. Um, so the core function of um, the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington is basically um, to provide policymakers, legislators, business people, academics, etc., with expert analysis on a wide range of topics about the Gulf. So we cover a very unusual topics such as arts, um, which we have a fantastic program um, covering arts in the Gulf, but also business, governments, all the way to energy and climate. We have also uh, energy and climate initiative that also has a lot of publications that have excellent quality. Um, and um, the, the Institute focuses on encouraging academic co coverage of relevant issues um, by supporting scholars in their research. And uh, the Alatia Foundation in general is non-political, um, but looking broadly then at the picture of what you see around the world, do you think that global efforts to combat climate change will force political change given the work that you've uh, done and looked at throughout your career? And if so, in what direction might those political changes occur? So I'm going to start with um, a disclaimer. Uh, political scientists like me are usually not in the business of predicting what will happen. We're actually very bad at that, as we have seen uh, with the Arab Spring. Nobody predicted anything. Um, so forecasting is usually what economists uh, try to do. Um, what political scientists do is that uh, we analyze what is happening or what has happened and the reasons why um, things are evolving the way they are. So it's always hard to know what the future holds because there are so many moving parts to this new reality that we live in and the stakes are very high for all of us at all levels of society and changes are happening very, very fast. So um, I can tell you what I think will happen but it is not data-based, all right? So overall, my sense is that climate change and the solutions that we are implementing or not implementing will have an impact on political systems. Uh, I think we will progressively enter a phase of what international relations scholars call existential politics. Um, to address the climate crisis, we need local, regional, national, and global coordination efforts both private sector led and public sector led and democratic and consultative institutions have to be at the heart of decision making processes so that all communities can be included in the dialogue. Um, there is some initial international relations and comparative politics literature that actually shows that. We've just obviously seen COP28 in Dubai in the Middle East again, and many people, many observers think that there's this idea, at least, that the technical aspects of addressing climate change have largely been resolved, or there's more agreement there, and now the major challenges are around financing those changes. Do you think uh, that's a fair assessment, and how do you address those financial issues? Well, so um, in terms of technical solutions, COP28 has been very instructive for me. Um, I'm not an engineer, so I don't spontaneously read about technical um, and te technological breakthroughs. But at COP28, I was able to listen to experts who, ha who are indeed making technical progress in various fields, such as um, CCS or decarbonization. And yes, climate finance is now at the heart of the problem because lower income countries will need a lot of money they don't have in order to buy and implement um, the available technologies. Um, 
and climate finance, at least coming from international financial institutions, is still very slow and too little to deliver on the challenges ahead. Um, now, my personal opinion is that technology won't be enough to address the changes we are facing. Um, climate change seems to have moved into some kind of a business of op opportunity for a lot of people. Um, but because of the sheer size of the climate crisis, um, technological solutions, I don't think will be enough. Uh, we also need um, to um, implement lifestyle changes, and I think that's the hardest part for people to hear. Um, but we've been living this way for a relatively short period of time where everything is always available to us, and it's been, what, maybe 60 years? Um, and we seem to have forgotten the way that our grandparents used to live, but it's not that far back in the past. So I think, yes, technological advances are, you know, fast paced and it's wonderful to see. Um, climate finance needs to be addressed more radically by rich countries um, and money needs to circulate much faster. Um, and also we need to reduce and reuse and do all the solutions that the UN has been um, advocating for. And many people think that the political will has been lacking for this. Perhaps that's changed in recent years with recent COPs. But um, as a political scientist, it must be intriguing to look at this fracturing of the, the post-World War II order, the multipolar world we're moving towards. If you take the world's two largest emitters, China and the US, the US-China trade war, lots of issues that they're at um, odds on on major issues but climate seems one area where they are willing to work together how important is that for for countries to work together politically and uh, move beyond their wider differences is it possible or is is it just a pipe dream yeah, so that, I think that's a great question. Um, there is very good international relations literature on this question, uh, but the short answer for me is basically, I hope they'll find a way to cooperate the same way they've been able to negotiate trade agreements and international conventions, right? When it's necessary, it looks like um, they'd be forced to um, find a way to work together. Um, and countries were able to sign the Paris Agreement, right? But today we need more concrete um, actions, um, not just non-binding agreements, uh, because we're running out of time. And another notion that seems to be gaining quite a lot of traction in recent years is the, the idea of an energy trilemma, that's sustainability, security and affordability. Uh, sustainability, obviously, decarbonizing our energy sources, security, making sure that there's a reliable supply of them, and then also affordability, which is crucial for the developing world, particularly which are being told to clean up their act when it comes to climate change, ensuring the cost of energy is reduced for consumers. Um, despite being lumped together then with this trilemma uh, notion, uh, they, there, there are times when these concerns can be or appear at least conflicting. What are your thoughts on on trying to categorize our goals as in the form of an energy trilemma, and how can the issue be resolved? Yeah. So, um, thank you for the question. So, I suppose um, economic circularity and technological advances are a big part of the answer, of course. Um, you know, circularity is all about using less energy, and technology allows us to produce and use less polluting energy for reduced cost. So I think they actually um, should go hand in hand, right? So for example, locally generating energy increases energy security and sustainability, and the cost of green energy such as wind and solar has steadily decreased over the past decade. So for example, the cost of wind has decreased by, I think, 40% onshore and around 30% offshore between 2010 and 2020. Um, and I think it should, give, it should keep going down until it reaches, it will keep going down until it reaches a price equilibrium. And fossil fuels are another uh, key issue nowadays. I mean, we saw again at COP28 the, the inclusion, uh, as soft as the language some people may have seen it, but essentially that fossil fuel uh, usage must decrease our production and um, usage of it uh, needs to go down if we're to tackle climate change. But with a growing global population, particularly in the developing world, energy demands are rising exponentially. Um, will the demand for fossil fuels rise then or fall, do you think, in the run up to 2050? Yeah, so um, 
It depends how fast uh, clean energy, um, uh, affordable clean energy develops as well, right? But basically, demand for fossil fuels is expected to rise and then plateau for a while, for a while, say at least a decade, and then decrease. Um, so in their uh, 2023 annual energy outlook, BP, for example, wrote that uh, demand for oil and gas would drop dramatically by 2050, falling from 80% in 2019 to what, between uh, 50 and 20% 20 in 2050. So those are their numbers, but some people are predicting a different um, kind of um, scenario, but the, I think that seems like a very reasonable scenario to believe in. And you did say earlier that political scientists don't really do crystal ball gazing, but uh, I think we well, when we get lots of people on these uh, Alatia Foundation podcasts, we do tend to ask them and the answers do differ very much in terms of peak oil demand and when, when that's going to happen. But I just want to move um, as, as we move along to something that perhaps is of great interest to you, but is to me as well. I, I studied politics at university and looked at the, the Middle East and the idea of rentier economies and rentier states came up again. We actually had a fascinating podcast recently with Giacomo Luciani, who obviously was considered uh, someone very, very um, imperative in the in the idea of the rentier state. But what are your thoughts on that now, given the economic diversification that we've seen in the Gulf region or uh, around the Middle East in recent uh, years, decades in some instances, how will these economies manage with a fall in income if the fossil fuels have to dry up? Uh, I'm glad you got, you know, Professor Luciani, I, I took a class with him at Princeton. He's fantastic. And of course, he wrote this seminal study in 1987, really theorizing um, the concept of the rentier state for the Gulf countries, which is still a, a theory that everybody in the field refers to. Um, so, of course, your question is a central question for Gulf countries, right? So how to balance the need for rents to uphold the, the social contract um, that uh, the state was developed upon while preserving the living conditions in the region. And that's a very tough balance to strike, right? So I think GCC countries now recognize the huge income potential green energy has, um, and they are working really hard to replace oil rents with green energy rents in the future, because in general, those governments have long -to -term, longer term uh, time horizons. And I think current leaders are working for future generations of leaders. Um, and so they are working really hard uh, to implement um, economic changes and diversification and become world leaders in renewable energy so that they can get income from that um, from that source of rent. Yeah. Yeah, and it's something I think that has really accelerated in in recent years. Being back here in the Middle East, in the Gulf at least, you're seeing um, governments really prioritise this diversification. It's no longer just something that's fanciful on paper, but something that they're really uh, aware of that's necessary to try and protect their economies in the future. As the uh, energy transition proceeds then, do you think the economic prominence of, of the Gulf states uh, particularly the likes of UAE, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, is that going to fall or do you think they're doing enough to try and remain economic powers? Again, that's a tough, tough question to answer, um, but I think that Gulf countries are acutely aware of what transformations need to happen if they want to maintain economic prominence. Um, NEOM, for example, in Saudi Arabia is a great example of their efforts to diversify and prepare for the future. Um, right? NEOM is thought um, of as a, a global trade hub, touristic destination, all powered by green energy, and they're advertising that. And I think that throughout the country, they are in Saudi Arabia, for example, the UAE is also doing a, well, a lot, um, Oman is doing a lot with green hydrogen. So I feel like all those countries are really thinking hard um, on how to keep up with the changes and not um, lose the economic prominence economic prominence. Yeah, uh, and just lastly then a question that we ask everyone uh, who comes on to the uh, podcast, the, the energy transition as it gathers momentum, as it proceeds, uh, do you think there's a great danger of stranded assets both above and below ground here in the, the Gulf region? So um, I wouldn't 
specifically call it a danger. I think that it is uh, stranded assets are probably a central issue in the GCC planning right now, uh, but not just um, for the GCC. You know, all oil exporting countries are concerned with this problem. Um, and I think massive, so for the Gulf specifically, massive investments in petrochemicals, for example, is a great way to address the issue of stranded assets because the world will probably stop using crude oil long before it stops using all the goods that are made out of oil, right? So petrochemicals, like industries, is a great way of still using assets that won't be um, that won't be used as like crude oil. Yeah, and again, you see major investment in the in that space, particularly in the, in the Gulf, uh, with some of the the countries here and what they're trying to do to try and get get more out of the rather than just pumping the the oil. But exactly. I think that's all we have time for. It concludes our interview today. Thank you very much, uh, Alina, for providing us with some great insights that I'm sure our listeners me. enjoyed. Yeah, no, thank you very much for for giving up the time, and we really look forward to uh, speaking to you again in the future. Perfect. Thank you so much. Bye. And as always, thank you very much for listening. Be sure to keep up to date with all of the Alatia Foundation's work by following us on X, well, that's Twitter, to you and me, and on YouTube. You can find us under our name, the Alatia Foundation.